God's been good. And he's been good to me even in the past week, I could testify. But listen, i got to preach this morning. I'm glad to see you. Didn't wear a handkerchief, didn't bring nothing, no Kleenex, nothing. I didn't know if he would just let me know. It would help me, right? But I'm glad to see you. Glad you're here. We've been preaching about marriage. Some of you scared me today. I saw you walking down the, uh, the, the, the driveway, coming into church, and some of your husbands and wives weren't holding hands. I said, oh, no, it didn't go as well last week as I thought it would. And then some of you are here, and your husband's not here, or your wife's not here, and I'm like, oh, no, is everything like, no, no, they're just out of town, it's all right. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. I got scared for a minute. You know, it looks kind of bad when you preach on marriage and somebody gets a divorce that week. It's just terrible. But I'm glad you're here. We've been preaching about, last week we preached about, till death do us part. And, and we talked about this part of till death do us part, not meaning until you kill your spouse. We didn't mean it that way. It means until one of you dies. That was the original intention of marriage is that it would be for life or until someone died. And, and, and many of you have seen these, these vows said a thousand different ways at a thousand different weddings. And probably since the 1500s when they were written, pretty much every marriage since then used some form of this vow or another. Now today it's a lot different than it was, and thankfully so, because some of the vows were kind of a little bit of a drag, but it's the, the vow said, I, so-and-so, take thee, so-and-so, to be my wedded wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and to honor, and it used to say, if you're a woman, to obey, that's funny, y'all. Forsaking all others and keeping myself only unto you till death do us part. Now, I want to say this to you that we want to talk about that today this idea of forsaking. My lights went out. I thought I was having a stroke. Everybody all right? Don't do that to me. I can't take it. It scares me to death. But I, today we want to talk about this part of the vow, forsaking all others. Can you all say that with me? forsaking all others. Everybody got that? How many people know what the number one killer of marriage is? It's, don't everybody at one time, yeah, it's adultery. Now you go, oh no, this is going to be awkward. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be awkward. You should be the preacher preaching this set of messages today, but the idea is we're preaching about forsaking all others. How many people realize that adultery is the number one killer of marriage? It's, it's just the way it is. It's how it is. I didn't make this up. It's just the way it is. Now, I want you to notice some statistics, and these statistics may shock you and it may surprise some of you, but it really shouldn't if you take it with an honest, open mind. Think about all the people you know, all the people you work with, all the people you've been around. I want you to notice some of these statistics. Statistics say 30 to 60% of married couples will cheat at least once in their marriage. Everybody with me? You go, no way, preacher. Look around this room. Everybody look around. You see all these loving spouses in here? 30 to 60% of these loving spouses will cheat. You got quiet. Is anybody shocked by that statistic? I, you shouldn't be. If you are, you live in a different world than I live in. Boy, this is going to be a rough day. This is the statistic that should not shock you, but everybody will act like it shocks them. 70%, 74% of men and 68% of women admit that they'd cheat if it was guaranteed they'd never get caught. Some of y'all in here are just scared to even look sideways right now. You're staring straight ahead. Like, please let her quit looking at me. 60% of affairs start with close friends or coworkers. Duh. An average affair lasts two years. That should shock you. 69% of marriages break up as a result of an affair being discovered. Get this, 
50% of marriages end in divorce. At least say amen so I know you're alive. And 70% of those marriages end because of an affair. Does everybody see how serious that problem is? Everybody with me? Some of y'all look at me like, man, I wish I'd have known this was the message. I would not be here. I want you to understand that the number one killer of marriage is adultery, but one of the top motives for murder is also adultery. Which brings me to my another ID channel favorite show, Deadly Affairs. You can ask any police officer, anybody that's in law enforcement, top three motives for murder, affair runs right up there in the top. Because it is difficult, heart-wrenching, and probably the most brutal thing that can happen to a person or a relationship. Now, again, the disclaimer, we're not preaching about yesterday. Everybody with me? I don't care if you're a marriage in here and this has happened to you in the past. You've had affairs in the past. You've had difficulty in the past. I don't care if you've been divorced in the past. We're not talking about the past. This is not a rear view message. Everybody with me? This is going forward. This is from today forward. This is from this moment forward. I don't care what happened yesterday. This message is to stop. Whatever will happen today and tomorrow, that's what it's about. Then you say, preacher, you're going to help us with this. Jesus is going to help you with this. I can't help you. You understand that marriages do not need life coaches. We don't need life coaches. You, you need Jesus and his word working in your heart, in your mind, and in your life. And that will help your marriage. Everybody with me? Don't ever leave here and go, Matt Burrell helped my marriage. I haven't. The Holy Spirit and Jesus will. Now, I want you to read Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. If you don't know this sermon, if you don't know what I'm reading here, this is Jesus teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount was like, he was preaching, and his preaching was kind, it was loving, but it was like petting a cat backwards. It was abrasive. Everything he came out of his mouth was kind. Every, every way he worded something was loving. But brother, when he said it, it was like, what? It was painful. Now, we're going to read it. We're going to get in it. I told you last week, this is a marriage series. We're preaching about marriage. That's adult content. Don't look at me weird, okay? All right. Verse 27. Jesus says this, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. Will you pray with me? Because I need help preaching this morning. Father, I pray God that you would help every person that is married or in a relationship in this room to determine in their heart that we are not going to let this problem destroy our marriage. That we are not going to allow it to break up our homes, to divide our children, to cause hurt, to break hearts, God, we are going to use your teaching to hold us accountable before you. Lord, help me as I preach. Help those that are here as they listen. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as a preacher, I used to not preach on these subjects. I would kind of, 
allude to them in my preaching. I would allude to them because I didn't want to come across as somehow weird, right? I didn't want to offend someone sitting in the chair in a way that they thought, well, this isn't church, and I don't want to hear that at church, and I'm not going to come back. But over the years, one of the things that I've noticed is that adultery does not just stalk down those who live in the club and don't care about Jesus. It kills Jesus' followers. It, it ruins people who go to church, who love the Lord. It attacks their family. It attacks it. And most people, and I want you to take notes, and when you take notes and you write these things down, I, I just want you to, to realize this is a plain message, but most people think that adultery is a sex problem. He says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, you don't really have to go into depth to understand what adultery is. Adultery is when a man or a woman who is married sleeps with, has, has an encounter with somebody that's not their spouse. That's adultery. It's really, really that simple. It's not that hard. And you go, and preacher, that's the number one killer of marriages? Absolutely. That's what it is. And it's an original Ten Commandment. You know, when God was given Ten Commandments, he's like, I got ten things to say that I want you to remember, and guess what he put on there? Adultery. That's how serious he is about it. And I want you to understand that he's so serious about it that thou shalt not commit adultery comes between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal. Most people would say, preacher, I hate a thief, and we're all against murder. Say amen if you're breathing. Thank you. Adultery is right there between them. Right there between them. And so God takes it as a very, very serious thing. But what happens is that we think this is a physical behavior, and Jesus wanted to correct that it's not a physical behavior, that's not what adultery is. It's not something that has physical, uh, a physical problem. And here's how we know that. When Jesus is teaching on it, he changes our thoughts. Why is it important for us to realize it's not a physical problem? Let me just tell you why. Because when you think that adultery is a physical problem, you can blame it on somebody else. Now listen to me. You can say things like, well, you know how she is. You, you see what I'm saying? She is. Let me say it one more time. Whose fault is adultery? Yours. Yeah but, yeah, but you don't know how she was. I don't care how she was. It ain't her fault. Somebody say amen. You blaming people? Look in the mirror. That, that's, right? Y'all okay? Everybody all right? Well, you know, preacher, if she wouldn't have dressed that way, somebody brought me tissues. Man, the Lord is good. Preacher, if she wasn't dressed that way, you know what you're doing? You're saying it's her fault. I'm going to say something controversial. Y'all get over it. The Muslims believe the same thing. So they want to dress them in those burqas where you can't see the woman. But guess what still happens? Adultery still happens. And people realize adultery is your fault and only your fault. It's not a physical problem, though. If it were a physical problem, there would be things that you could do about it that would change it and completely remove it, but it's not. Let's look at what the real problem is. Jesus lays it out and says, I know you've heard. Don't you touch her. That's what he's saying. I know you've heard that. Don't touch her. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman, watch this, to do what? Okay, there's three people that can read. It's not the looking on a woman that's the problem, notice. What's that one word? Let's try it one more time. What is it? Lust. That's what it is. You understand that it's not a physical, sexual problem. 
It's a lust problem. Can I say it like this? It's a heart issue. Where does adultery occur? In you. Everybody with me? In you. If you commit adultery, it's because you longed after, desired, and wanted to possess somebody other than your spouse. You can try to water it down. You can try to sugarcoat it for what it is. It's you and only you. I was weak. I want to just slap people when they say that. Preacher, I didn't mean to. Oh, your spouse should just choke you to death when you say that. Sin is one of those things that it's hard for us to admit, but here's what the real truth is. I wanted to, I liked it, and I did it. And it's all my fault, and I was wrong. If anybody else is at fault, I'm not sorry. Somebody say amen. It's quiet in here, and I'm okay with it. I like it. James 1 says this, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And when sin comes forth, it brings death. Here's the way it works. You lust after something, and because you want something, it brings sin into your life. And the wages of sin, the Bible tells us, is death. Here's how it works. I want something, I sin toward it, and because I sin toward it, I and other people around me pay the price. Can I give you two examples of this in Scripture? Let me show you the first one. The first one's a woman's fault. The second one's a guy's fault. Y'all okay with that? I'm even. This is, fifth, this is an even church. The first example we have is Eve. Now, did Eve, when God said, hey, don't you eat of that tree? She said, I don't care what God said. I'm going to eat anything I want, anytime I want. I'm going to go do it right. Is that what it said? Was that, was that Eve's intention? Of course not. She didn't just wake up and get, I don't care what the Almighty says. I'll do what I want it. No. That's not what happened. The Bible says she was just kicking it in Eden. Just chilling. And she saw that the tree was good for food. She saw it. Remember what Jesus said? If a man looketh on a woman, that's not the sin, but that's where it kind of starts. She saw something, it was like, hmm. Hmm. The Bible says, and then she realized she desired it. It had qualities that would make one wise. It had qualities that she liked and admired. You know, that's how every affair, affair starts. Hmm. And, and then it's, you know, she looks pretty good. The Bible says the second thing, the third thing that happened is she then acted on the lust that began in her heart. She looked, she lusted, and then she took the fruit. End of the story. She ate the fruit, that was it, right? Nope. You see, she took a step that affected her. But that step not only affected her, what's the next thing it says? She gave it to her husband. You see, sin never only affects you. Now, I want everybody in here, somebody in here, I'm, and the reason I preach these messages is because a room this big, some guy or some gal in this room is flirting and messing and around right on the verge of an affair right now. The Bible calls it taking fire into your bosom. Somebody is, you are. And what you think in your mind is, I'll do this It'll be fine. Nobody will get hurt. I'll be, I'll be the one. I'm just reminding you what you already know. That is not how it works. It will affect you. It will affect your spouse. It will affect the other person. And if they have a spouse, their spouse as well. Not to mention your children, 
their children, and your reputation. Is everybody with me? Eve messed up. Not only did it affect her, it affected Adam, which ultimately affected who? Us. It has a long, lingering effect. Sin is that thing you throw the rock in the middle of the pond, and it begins to ripple out, and it ripples out, and it ripples out, and on every shore of that pond, that ripple rolls up to it. It does. You see, the real problem is lust in the heart. Everybody with me? I'm going to get you help here in a minute. Here's the guy that messed up. And we're really good at it. Guys are really good at being stupid. They are. I know this because I am one. I want you to notice the second example we have is King David. Now, it would take me too long to read you the story of King David and Bathsheba, but here's essentially what happened. In Israel, there was a time when they went to war. All the men, listen to me, all the men went where? How many of the men went to where? War. David stayed home. David shirked his responsibility and what he should have been doing, number one. And the Bible says he stayed home and he was up on his roof and he looked over the roof and he could see a woman taking a bath. And why was she taking a bath in the open? Where are all the men at? They were at war. The Bible says that David saw her. Is that the problem? Problem came when David said, hey, who's that woman over there? And they said, uh, that's Bathsheba. You know, her husband is Uriah. He's in the army. He's in your army. He said, what do they do for a living? Where are they from? How old is she? How many kids they got? All, he got, to, got to inquiring about her. You know what began to happen? He began to lust after her. And then the Bible says that he sent people, and the Bible uses this terminology, and took her to his house. You've got to understand, a king telling servants, go get her and bring her here. She didn't get to go, no, no, I don't want to do that. Everybody with me? He's the king. You defy the king, what happens? Die. He brought her in. He had an affair with her. And in this affair, he sent her home. What did he say? Nobody will ever know. You know why they won't know? All the men were. And she was pregnant. Her husband has a problem. David's got a problem now. So he calls his husband to his house and he says, hey, how's everything going in the war? And the husband tells him, he says, hey, go home and spend the night with your wife and then go back to war in the morning. You know how he thought. You know, they'll go home and, you know, and then, then she'll be like, yeah, and it'll be all right, right? But the Bible says that Uriah was a good man. Uriah slept outside and wouldn't go in and sleep in his own home because all the men were where? And he didn't think it was right that he could sleep with his wife if they couldn't. So he slept outside. And then David had a real problem. So you know what he had to do. What I say that my, one of my favorite shows is? Deadly Affairs. He killed Uriah. Had him killed. He said, that's terrible. It happens all the time. You, you understand that David's fall problem was not seeing Bathsheba. His problem was lusting after Bathsheba and then acting on the lust that he had. And when you have lust in your heart, sex is the result. It is not the problem. Is everybody, everybody with me? So we always say, you know, that's the problem, right? That the, the sex is the problem. It's not the problem. The problem is the lust in your heart. You see, lust is in your heart. Eventually, the physical action will occur. Y'all okay? People dying in here, right? Y'all dying. Like, I can physically see people sweating right now. It's okay. It'll get better. No, it won't. It's getting worse. You say, preacher... 
How do I stop this? Now, I'm going to give you some very practical things. And this happens to me every time I preach like this. Some of you are going to go out and some of you are going to confront me and say, no way, preacher, no way. I mean, you think that's happened to me? Several times. But you know, the problem is, man, things holler when it hurts. And resistance is natural. But I want you to understand this. If you want a healthy marriage, this is how you help it. You okay? Y'all, everybody ready? Here's how you help it. Number one, you must practice eye discipline. Now, I'm referring to men more than women only because I'm not a woman and I don't know. I, really, I mean, I'm being honest. I don't know what you guys go through. I, I don't know. But I do know this. Jesus said this to the men. He said, I say unto you, whosoever looks on a woman to lust after her, he's committed adultery in his heart already. He says, listen to me. If you, if you want to have a happy marriage where no adultery occurs, you must guard your eyes. Listen, men, I know the temptation. I know the problem. I'm not speaking from perfection. I'm speaking from problematic life. You see, the Bible says this in Matthew 6. Jesus said that the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, meaning if you look for things that are evil, you love to look at evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. Job made this statement. He said, I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? He said, I made my eyes a promise and said, look, I'm not going to look at stuff I shouldn't look at. Why would I be looking at somebody else's wife? Or some woman that's not my wife quiet in here man you know I'm not lying you know the difficulty Jesus knows the difficulty David said this he prayed this in Psalm 119 well after the event with Bathsheba he said turn away mine eyes from beholding vanity and quicken thou me in thy way he said God help me not to look at what I shouldn't look at Bring me alive in the things of you. He said, help me. I'm going to tell you all this, and you all know this. I'm not, this ain't brain surgery. Maybe some of you all here naive and dumb, but I doubt it. I doubt it. If you're a woman in here, you should automatically be a private investigator. It's just in you all. If you're a guy in here, you got common sense, you know what I'm fixing to say is the truth. The most dangerous thing you own is this thing right here. I, it's going to get quiet, and this is where I'm going to get in trouble. I don't care. This is porn at your fingerprint tips 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Y'all ain't never heard a preacher use that word. So I said, preacher, how old should my child be when they get a phone? Whenever you're okay with them having unbridled access to pornography. Whenever you're comfortable with that, you say, but I can put these things on where I can know what they look at. Yeah, but they didn't look at it. See, y'all missed that, didn't you? Everybody, they didn't seen it. By the time you realize they've seen it, that's like, man, I need an app to know when my kid eats arsenic. But haven't they already ate the arsenic? Yeah, but when they get home, by God, I'm talking to them about it. It's a $97 billion a year industry, not cell phones, pornography. I think 97 billion. And I know, women, I know you go, I just don't understand it, and you won't. 
Hey, listen, you think your husband's a bad guy? No, he, he just, he's just a guy. You, he's a bad guy. No, he's a guy. No, he's a bad guy. No, no, he's a guy. No, no, what you married is what you wanted to see, but what you really married was a guy. It's quiet in here because you think somehow that makes your guy a bad guy. No, he's just a guy, a dumb guy, but a guy. That's just how it is. I can't believe it. Don't ever use those words. If you can't believe it, it's because you're naive and dumb. It's because you really don't understand the male mindset. Now, it's quiet. And we're going to talk about how men don't understand the women's mindset in a couple weeks. You definitely won't be here for it. <laughs> Cell phones have this new app. It's awesome for married couples. It's called Snapchat. It's where you send people pictures that disappear. Some of you need to go home right now. So if you're a 40-year-old man, you got Snapchat. What is? What's wrong with you? You 35 years old. You've been married for 10 years. You got Snapchat. Listen, you ain't in high school. Get rid of that son of a gun. Who in the world do you need to send pictures to? Well, maybe my wife wants to send pictures, and I don't want. Listen, let her text it to you. You can keep that one. Social media helps us keep up with our ex-girlfriends and boyfriends from high school. They've helped us out, Chad. They got these new secret messages that I can message and they disappear. Some of you in here say, I didn't know that. Check it out, I'm telling you. <laughs> Instagram, Facebook, they're trying to help you. They're trying to help you cheat. You know, there's Hookup sites, naps, Tinder. You got preacher, that's a dating app. No, it's not. 18 to 25 percent of Tinder users are married people. Married. Tinder don't care about your marriage. They don't care. Satan may be the CEO. I don't even know. I gotta move on because it's dying, y'all getting cold. But men, women, I don't, women, I don't know. I'm like I said, I've never been a woman. Guard your eyes. Watch what you're looking at. Some of you need to go home today. Completely wipe your phone and start over. You say, preacher, I, you think there's people? I know there's people in here that need to do it. Why? Because there's people in here. People got problems. And don't be some 75-year-old going, I don't know what's wrong with them 25 year You know what's wrong with them 25 they young and dumb. They ain't learned what you learned yet. Here's the one that nobody's going to like. I'm going to get scolded for. I don't care. Marriage guardrails. Does anybody know what a guardrail is put up by the DOT for? It's for people who are riding down the road and go, you know what? I'm going to run off this cliff and kill myself. Is that why they put up guardrails? No. They put them up so if you drop a cup of coffee in the floor and you're like me and you're down there like this trying to get it, and all of a sudden, you come off the road, you hit the guardrail, and you don't hit the what? The cliff. Does everybody see what I'm saying? Right? Jesus said, if your right hand, if your right eye offends you, throw it away. Pluck it out and throw it away. If your hand offends you, cut it off. The, is Jesus really saying cut your hand off every time you mess up? None of us in here had hands past six. Just right with none of us being here, but nothing but just bodies. We done cut everything off. What he's saying is, remove the obstacles that offend you. And I'm going to tell you this, and I'm going to give you some practical reasons, and this is where I always get scolded, but I don't care. Every marriage needs to sit down and to do some things. You guys need to sit down and say, hey, me and you married. We're going to be married for the next 100 years. And we need to set up some guardrails in our marriage. Now listen to me. It's not because we're jealous. It's not because we're stalkers. It's not because we're paranoid. It's because we're humans. We live in 2023 and we need to have some guardrails for our marriage. The number one guardrail every marriage needs, now listen to me, is accountability. Now, I'm going to tell you, 
What does that look like? And so, this is where people get mad, and that's okay. Some of you need to hear it. Your wife or husband needs to have free access and the passwords to your devices. Amen. And somebody in here just said, no, not mine. You know what that tells me? No, preacher, I just like privacy. No, no, that's not why. If my 15-year-old son said, Dad, I'm not giving the password to my phone, when he woke up, he would give me the password because I'd know it wasn't because of privacy why he was trying to keep it. I would know the reason he don't want to give it to me is he knows I know what he's doing on it. And if a husband won't give their wife their cell phone with the password on it, or a wife won't, I can almost guess that the man is looking at porn and the wife is talking to somebody shouldn't, she, she shouldn't be. I didn't say that. Statistics say that. That's just how it is. Well, I'm not cheating. We're just talking. Yet. Boy, it's, I mean, y'all dying. You see, it allows transparency in your marriage. See, if I get up in the morning, I got a routine. I get in the morning early, I get my coffee. After a coffee, I, I do my devotions, kill some time, go to the gym. That's what I do every morning. My wife gets up later than I do. And, I, and you can go to my house, you can ask my wife. I get up, when I leave, I tuck my iPad between the cushion of my chair, just right here. And it sits there all morning. And my wife knows my passwords. And you know what that helps me with? Not that my wife checks my iPad every morning. I don't know if she does. Maybe she does. I don't know. But I do know this. If I'm tempted, it's hit, no. She's going to think something weird. My iPad ain't where it was. Is everybody okay in here? Now, preacher, you have to do that? Yeah. Yeah. You know something else everybody needs to do? Share your location. Amen. I've had men say, I don't want my wife having my location. Again, you know what that tells me? Now, is it annoying when your wife goes, hey, why are you at Walmart? Yeah. <laughs> but what's good about having her have my location, it's going to keep me from stopping by somewhere I shouldn't. And in that moment, when you're just having that stupidity that just overwhelms you, it happens, guys. It happens, gals. And you think, this ain't going to hurt nothing, but man, she might know I'm there. It's going to keep you from going there. Everybody with me? Somebody said, preacher, I can't believe somebody told me one time, I can't trust my husband or my spouse, you know. I mean, I just won't be married to them. You're a liar. There's a lot of things in your life you do that you have to keep an eye on you love your kids that you don't trust them <laughs> you said no i trust my kids you're dumb <laughs> you're sitting here and you think well i trust my spouse i wouldn't trust is something that's commonly earned together as you build your lives together Amen. not that they would but just keep that from happening safety precautions we have to take number two avoid being alone with people that's not your wife or husband they're the opposite sex. Never have relationships with people that your spouse wouldn't just love for you to have a relationship with them. Well, me and her, we work together. You know, we're just friends. If a guy ever tells you he's just friends with a girl, he's a liar. My best friend's a woman. Whatever. Unless it's your wife. Can I tell you something else, God? Trust your spouse's intuition. When your wife says to you, she's way too friendly to you. Trust it. There's just something down inside her that knows. And you dumb, you like it. She says, hey, she's too friendly. You say, yes, ma'am. And wives, when your husband looks at you and goes, if that guy looks at you again like that, you're going to read about me in the paper. <laughs> so I don't want my husband being like that. Why would you get married then? Let me tell you something. I love y'all. I love Jesus. I'm trying to be mess with my wife. I'll kill you. Well, I sure go to jail trying. And I just put inside of me. God gave that to me. 
And I'm going to give you this third one. This is the one that some of the guys are going to hate, men and women are going to hate. You've got to contain adultery by having a lot of sex with your spouse. All the men go, yeah, preach it, preacher. <laughs> but it's the truth. God put you together for a reason. Amen. You're to help one another. I've got to be done. Marriage checklist this week. Health checklist. Health checklist this week. Who and what is on and in your heart? Amen. Who is it? Who is it? Number two, are you practicing eye discipline in your life? Have you got things set up in a way that helps you not do this stuff? And have you guys as a married couple ever sat down and said, okay, don't matter about yesterday, doesn't matter about a year ago, doesn't matter what we did the first 10 years, but we're going to sit down and we're going to decide some strategies to a fair-proof our marriage so that when we do lose our mind for that split second, we don't run off the cliff, right? Father, I pray, God, you'd speak to every heart here. Help us, God, to have a burning desire to save our marriages, to keep our marriages. 